My name is Warren Block. I'm here to talk about automated documentation proofreading. And if that's not the talk you're expecting, you're in the wrong room. I know there are other talks you could attend. I'd like to thank you for flying W Block Airlines. Exits are at the rear and the front of the room. The question we start with is why is documentation hard to write? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the big ones is rules. Rules, rules, rules. There are so many different types of rules. Uh, there are particular type of rules for text files. Those are pretty lax, spelling, punctuation, line wrap. That's fairly easy. It's, there's nothing being strict except your readers. And if you disappoint them, you let them down, but they probably won't complain. They may go somewhere else. Then you get to MDoc, which is far, far more complicated. There are many more rules with this. It's not particularly strict, but to get the output you want, you have to comply with those rules. And then, of course, for FreeBSD, we use DocBook SGML currently for much of our documentation. And there, the rules get a lot weirder, a lot more complicated, a lot more involved. And there are two sets of rules. There are the tool chain rules, which say you must use this type of formatting and this type of text. And there are the FreeBSD documentation project rules, which say you should conform to these standards. You should use this type of wording. You should indent with two spaces per line, that type of rule. And those are un informal rules that are not enforced by anything so far. Another problem we get to that makes documentation hard to write is existing documentation is inconsistent. Some is really well done. And I'm not talking about the writing style. I'm talking about the formatting, the tags, the uh, complete package other than the content. And for me at least, and I'm sure many other people, the way you start working on this stuff is not from a blank slate. You don't read the MDoc man page and jump in writing from scratch. You find one that's similar to what you're looking to do and copy it. The problem being, if the one you picked to copy was not done very well, it gets you started on, on a bad foot. And the problem, the reason we have those inconsistent examples is because at present there isn't really anything that's out there looking at them. Here's another example of DocBook SGML. That might help a little. There's an error in this paragraph. The tool chain doesn't consider it an error. Moreover, it doesn't report it as an error. Who sees it? Don't say what it is, but hold your hand up. OK, about half, a third, sitting more and more. That one. That is supposed to be a closing paragraph tag. Those are, I don't know what it is with those. We have and still have. Many of those, they're hard to see. It, your mind or your eyes expecting to see a closed paragraph tag so it zooms right over them. So the tool chain doesn't care. Why doesn't it help us? It's a computer. It's supposed to automate things. It's supposed to remember stuff like that. And now we come to the question of why worry? It's documentation. Even if it was a program, if it builds, ship it. Good enough. I mean, it's documentation. It's secondary, right? Consistency in the documentation encourages quality in the documentation and in the programs themselves. You want to have that high, consistent level of quality, or the end user and other users will be disappointed by varying levels of quality. And of course, also for maintenance. If the documentation is all consistent, it's easy to maintain, it's easy to modify, it's easy to understand both for existing documentation writers and new ones. And then, of course, if your documentation is consistent, it's easy to convert to other formats. And an example of that is right now we have DocBook SGML. We really, really want to get that into DocBook XML. But not all those documents are consistent, and the conversion can fail on some. And of course, there's talk of OpenBSD's Mandoc. If our documentation pages, our man pages, are consistent, automated conversion can apply to that. 
And there are other future formats that may not have even been invented yet. I personally kind of like ASCII doc, which is sort of a, not a, a, it's a step in an opposite direction or a different direction than most is going. But the point of that is, if all your documents are consistent, they can be automatically converted. And again, another part of the why you shouldn't just ship it is entropy. Problems accumulate if there's nothing validating these documents other than the tool chains which may or may not tell you. And for an example of that, the FreeBSD Porter's Handbook is 16,000 lines, uh, approximately, of DocBook SGML. It's about 50,000 words. It's a, it's a book. To fix white space problems alone, that would be indentation, tabs where there should be spaces, tabs mixed inside content, or white space at the end of a line, required an 8,000 line commit on a 16,000 line document. And then another 4,000 line commit. Now, it's not 12,000 lines total. Some of those overlap. But that's appalling. If that was a program, it wouldn't compile. And that type of entropy, that noise, accumulates because you have many, many different people contributing small pieces, rewriting small pieces. And we need to avoid that because a document, that particular one, it was hard to work on. The indentation levels were wrong. It had many problems. And because it was so hard to work on, it discouraged fixing problems. And this book is one, I mean, every ports committer reads this. Or, let's be honest, parts of it. <laughs> right, just, just the flip to the page you need and use that. So what can we do? Well, let's make things easier for writers. We want to encourage writing. The programs, the best program in the world is useless unless you can tell the user how to use it. And that's what documentation is for. And let me say that again. The best program in the world is useless if the user can't figure it out. So you can write the best thing there is, but that work may be lost. So the other thing we need to do is we need to make it easy for people who rarely work on documentation because that is about everybody. When was the last time you worked on a man page? For some people, last night. For some people, half an hour ago. But for many people, six months ago or a year ago. And that's just impossible to remember the right formats and rules for man pages when you work on them rarely. And most people work on them rarely. Or docbook, the, the same thing applies. Maybe you just want to do a patch to fix one part of a book. If you haven't looked at it in six months or a year or forever, those rules will not come back to you. It's, I tell people, I paint my house every five years. At the beginning of it, I'm an amateur. At the end, I'm a professional. And then five years later, I'm an amateur again. It's the same thing. So if we can make it easier, we can encourage programmers to document their work, which, like I said a couple days ago, programmers don't write man pages because man pages suck. And they suck to write, it's being specific on that. And so let's make them easier. And we can encourage programmers to document stuff. And we can help try to avoid that situation where they fixed a long-standing problem or added a, a, a long-wanted feature, and it's just not in the man page. Let's fix that. Let's make it easier. We can also encourage end users and occasional users of a particular program to contribute to the documentation. And that is tremendously important. Every programmer will tell you, I, there are ways that my program was used that I never anticipated. And there are end users who tried to do things I thought were obvious and yelled at me later because they weren't. So we can get that feedback from end users and get it in there, those common experiences, which are valuable. And finally, we can make it easier for writers to expand and improve the documentation we have, which is the point. We want it to be clear, we want it to be concise, and we want it to be thorough. And if you have to worry about, well, I forgot to put a blank line on line 17, 
that distracts from trying to be creative and improve the documentation, what it's writing, what it's talking about. Okay, so what can automated proofreading do? Because clearly there are some things it can't. There are some things the human has to be responsible for. Well, first off, it can remember things. Uh, I am a sufferer of CRS syndrome. Does anybody else have that? CRS stands for can't remember stuff. <laughs> And a computer, I mean, let's, let's make a program where all these stupid little rules that the, the human has trouble remembering can be checked by a program. That's what it's for. It can also help us find errors, either errors that the tool chain would find that we want to catch first, or errors the tool chain just ignores, which there are many of those. And it can help us comply with standards. We have two kinds of standards, like I talked about before. And the FreeBSD documentation primer has a list of, let's call them standards, they're rules, but they're effectively suggestions because there's nothing to enforce them. Like, and this is sort of a contentious thing, after the end of a space, or the end of a sentence, use two spaces. I didn't realize that was contentious, but it is. And it doesn't really matter because that's what the documentation primer says to use. So if you want to get your stuff in there, Use two spaces. The problem we had was there was no, nothing checking for that. And with an automated proofreader, we can help encourage people to comply with those semi-formal, informal rules by saying, hey, this is not in compliance. And I've, I've seen this happen. People will fix those, not because they agree, but just to get the error checker to shut up. Leave me alone. Uh, Amiga people, remember GOMP? Anybody? Get out of my face. It was a program that would you could tell. No, never mind. <laughs> we can also help the, use this to help keep mistakes out of the tree. Database people will tell you it's far easier to keep mistakes out by input checking than to try and find them afterwards. And that goes back to the entropy example. Those noise that noise and errors accumulate, and it becomes such an ugly job to fix those that it doesn't get done. So if we keep them out from the first place, we avoid that. And the end result of all this is we can let the writer concentrate on the message. That's what we want. We want the human to do the hard work of telling you what this program does or how to use this feature. All right, so what tests can be automated? Well, for all files, we can check simple things. We can check spelling, but we'll do this in a different way because, honestly, I didn't want to write a spelling checker that would be able to spell check any random text file. C source files have certain rules for spell checking. So what we did was look through FreeBSD man pages, text files, and docbook source files and looked for existing misspellings and made a list of known misspelled words. And that tends to work because you have a fairly stable population of people committing to the FreeBSD source, the, the documentation source. And it doesn't change. A few people start new and a few people leave. But the same people tend to use the same misspellings. So we can catch those. No, we, we didn't want to point fingers. And it is very consistent. You, I've gotten to the point where when I look at a file, I can sometimes tell from the, the consistent misspellings who did it. Uh, the other thing we have a problem with is repeated words. And that's due to the way computer writing is. You'll be writing a sentence, you'll pause to think, and you'll end up retyping the last word. So you'll get lots of is, is, and, and. They are very, very common. and they. When you're reading that sentence, it, it pauses you. It's like a verbal pause, uh, uh, and it breaks your train of thought. We can catch those very easily because we don't care what they are. We just look for one word, and if the next word after it is duplicated, we, get, we say, hey, here's a duplicated word. And bad phrases, and I want to be careful about this because I think some people, I call these things bad phrases, and down at the bottom there I say the, to, to, for. Those are in there occasionally, and 
Some people seem to think those are from non-English speaking people, but in my experience, the people who've learned English as a second language speak it better than the people who've learned it as a first. I think it's another one of those pause things where you're writing and you pause to think and then you write something odd. And then we can test for style. And what we have right now, now is a very fairly simple-minded thing where it tests for usage of words and suggests other options. And there are reasons of, for all these, and we'll show some of those later. And also on man pages, it checks to see if there are examples. As, as we said earlier this week, even a trivial example is better than no example. For MDoc, there are certain things we can test for. Uh, a free BSD guideline is sentences should always begin on a new line. Ours don't always now, but we can check for that. We can also check that the document date was updated when non-trivial changes were made. And this is kind of what started this whole thing because I had Glenn Barber say, oh yeah, you should change the document date. And it's like, well, I knew that had to be changed sometime, but it never occurred to me. And I'll bet money that six months down the road, I will forget that again. It's, you don't normally change it, and it should be the last thing you change before committing. And then the structure. MDoc 7 says there are eight minimum macros you need for a man page. Does anybody know what they are? I don't, except because I'm looking at it here. Those are the eight minimum macros in that order. Many of our man pages meet that spec, many do not. And some of them that don't are in the contrib section. Okay, for doc with HTML, we can test a fair amount. We can test for white space, like I talked about earlier. We can test for indentation, which is actually fairly tricky. I got ahead of myself there. We can check for tag usage style, which certain tags, like if you put a program listing tag inside a paragraph, it leaves huge, huge white space gaps in your output document in HTML and PDF, or maybe just HTML now. But it looks bad. Let's not do that. Let's warn the user. Title capitalization, we have standards for that, but we don't enforce them. It's actually the associated press style. Let's check for that. And so finally, the result of this is Igor, the lab assistant. You may say it Igor if you're a fan of the movie from some years back. And some of the design goals with this is it must be quick and easy to use. It shouldn't require setting anything up. It should auto-detect the type of input file. You shouldn't have to tell it. It should handle multiple files and compress files, like, say, a directory of man pages, like if you want to check everything in man 8, which I've done. There's plenty of errors in there. And I don't want to have to decompress each one and feed it through something. It should do that for me. And we should also test for conformance with the FreeBSD primer, the FreeBSD documentation primer because we can then encourage those standards. And sometimes when you're modifying a man page or another file, you only want to test the errors that, test for errors in the section that you've added. Uh, many of our files, like the Porter's Handbook, have other errors, but you don't want to take on that whole job of fixing everything at once. And so we should be able to test just for white space or just for indentation. And it should avoid false positives, so true errors are not lost in the output. And the implementation. Well, it's written in Perl, but whatever. And I'm, I'm serious about that. I, I dare you to write something better so I don't have to work on this anymore. I will <laughs> contribute tests. I don't care what it's written in, but it's regular expressions all the way down. So you may want to factor that into your choice of language when you do that. All it does really is apply a bunch of usually regular expression tests to each line. And what does it look like? Well, here's some output. This is, this is actually, can everybody see that or should I turn off the other lights? And don't worry about this one, we'll have a better one in a second. And here you can see we're running Igor with the dash D flag which means ignore that doc date. We're just checking these, these files for existing errors. We're not making changes to them yet. And a list of compressed man pages 
and then we're piping the output into LAS. And here it shows the name of the file, and then in this one, for example, on line 102, it found a bad phrase, 2-4, which it's highlighted with brackets, on, on the rest of the line in context there. And there's spelling errors and trailing white space, a space or a tab at the end of a line. Repeated words will not be B. And I didn't believe these were that common until I coded it and ran it over some stuff. You, you get those, well, these can't be. I mean, they've got to be rare. They're not. And here is a, uh, one of the uh, man page, the MDoc things, where a section header description has been used, but section header synopsis has not been defined yet. That's not required by the tool chain, but the MDoc man page says it is. Now, this particular output, I find this exceptionally hard to read. But it's there, so there's a plain ASCII version which you may be able to incorporate into an editor. So you could highlight a section of documentation, say, show me the errors in this section, and then grab those line numbers and error messages out of here. Stealing the idea from mostly code spell, we use ANSI highlights, ANSI color highlights. And that's what the uh, dash R flag is for, which corresponds to the R in less, which is able to display those. And this is the same output, but with the ANSI color highlighting. The error messages are highlighted in different colors, so they don't all blend together. It turns out there aren't enough ANSI highlight colors that are visible to do all the different errors, give each their own code. But this helps keep them from all blending together. And for white space problems, we use reverse video. And that, it helps, I think. It helps tremendously. And like we talked about earlier, this is the style analysis. And it is very simple-minded. It's not, it checks for word frequency. And it says, you use 512 times. Well, you and your are a informal style. Don't use that if you can avoid it. Try to be formal and objective. This is sort of a uh, soft suggestion here on these. And it checks for various uses of other words. Simply and basically, well, I'm going to, that's, I feel when somebody says basically to me, they're saying, I'm going to dumb it down for you. And, and, and you are not tracking who actually commits that. <laughs> so far as any of you know, no. <laughs> it also points out use of Latin, e.g. and i.e., which tend to be used in academia and science environments and might be constructively replaced with the actual English words. And it turns out that many people use those incorrectly. For DocBook, we have another issue where we have many translators, and they care about white space. Or rather, they don't care about it. They don't want to see white space commits because that does not affect their translation. The uh, dash Z up here, capital Z, only checks for white space problems. So you can take a book like the Porter's Handbook, feed it into this, get a huge output that shows all the various white space problems, fix those, commit it, and the translators are unaffected. And if anybody's looked at diffs for white space, it is horrible. This is the flip side of that previous one. This is content, the opposite of white space. And these are the ones that translators would care about. Uh, it, Checks for things like no comma after EG because typically there is a pause after that. For example, or that is, there's a pause after that. Uh, capitalization, these words should be wrapped in file name or command tags, in which case it wouldn't complain about them. And spelling errors, and again, EG and IE. Here's an open paragraph without closing. That's that error we looked for at the very first. That means you started a new paragraph, but there was no closing tag on the previous one, which means it was one of those slashes left off. And finally, where is it? It's in ports as TextProc Igor, thanks to Glenn Barber. And I have it on my website there, which I will show in another slide here in just a second. Lessons learned, well, optimize regular expressions and short circuit whenever possible. DocBook SGML indentation is decidedly non-trivial. Uh, I could use a word for that, but I won't. 
<laughs> Finally, syntax highlighting is good for white space. And on that web page, which I will come back to here in a second, there is a syntax highlighter for white space for the nano editor, which nobody uses except me, I think, uh, which will show you that hidden white space at the end of lines. Use it on your documents. You'll be appalled. And finally, advertising. Because a program that will help you with proofreading documentation does you no good unless people know about it. And that's partly why I'm here. I want to let people know about this. Let's make it easier and let's improve our documentation. And for the future, well, there could be a rewrite. Nobody's volunteered yet, but it's still early. Better DocWick indentation testing, that may be affected by our switch over to XML. And advanced language analysis, instead of words, have it look at sentences, have it look at paragraphs and say, this paragraph right here is unclear. We could do that. I can't, but somebody could. And other languages, and by that I mean non-English languages. We can have the, uh, the spelling checker look for other words. The markup will still be in English. So all we'd have to do is add those other misspelled words. And that's it. I want to thank you for coming. And I want to particularly thank my mentors, Glenn Barber and Benedict Reuschling.